All right, so my role is to talk about durability, and I figured maybe the easy way to do this is to look at how the way we think about durability has evolved and is continuing to evolve over time. So when I first got involved in this game, before Shiraz had any gray hair, the way we used to do permeability or durability was we would add cement, we would make it strong and specify a nice big strength number and write a specification and pay bonuses on strength. We would make sure there was lots and lots of air. And if we were in doubt, we would measure the slump. Uh, and this sort of kind of worked because for the, for the mixtures that we were working with way back when, all of these activities in, indirectly affected the water cement ratio. And that is the, the, the parameter that actually directly controls potential durability. So they weren't bad things to do with the materials that we were playing with at the time. However, with the advent of supplementary cementing materials and water reducing admixtures, that direct relationship between adding cement and improving properties suddenly went away. And so we started to talk about controlling the water cementitious materials ratio. We talked about the benefits of adding the right amount of SCMs to the mixture to get things like permeability, ASR protection. We were starting to learn to pay attention to the properties of the air void system, not just total air. And we also started to talk about the idea of putting sealants on. Now, again, all of these parameters or activities were trying to provide the concrete, the ability to keep water out of the system. So like in this top photograph, water that gets sucked into the concrete very quickly may well be transporting aggressive chemicals with it. The water itself may be adding to the, the saturation and so freeze thaw risk. If we can keep the water outside of the concrete, we're buying time. And that's what it's all about when we talk about durability in our pavement systems. So again, yeah, keeping the water out was our key message. And as I already said, supplementary cementing materials and water reducing admixtures remove the links that are hardwired and are still hardwired into many of our brains is that slump and water cement ratio are not directly correlated. Strength and permeability are not stri strictly correlated and cement content and any performance factor other than perhaps workability is not directly correlated. Now, I know some of those are heresy, and if we want to argue about that, we can sometime in the future. But building on these um, points, we've started to rethink from the fundamentals, what are we really trying to do with durability? We're trying to make the concrete survive the environment to which it is exposed. So the tree trick question then is, what is the exposure? Concrete pavement in Minnesota has completely different requirements from the pavement in Florida because of the difference in de-icing, salt, freeze-thaw action, temperature variations, uh, chlorides, seawater, sulfates, all those sort of things are completely different. And so you know, when somebody says, is this durable concrete, your immediate question back to them should be, well, where is it going? What is it being subjected to? Then we can think a little bit about, well, what are the attack mechanisms behind the failures that we may expect? And then how, what levers can we pull? What are the things that we can adjust to ensure that we are addressing those attack mechanisms? And, and again, this uh, graphic is from one of my PhD students, um, where she made back concrete with different cement contents and measured the rapid chloride test. Um, and what you can see is that increasing cement actually made the rapid chloride numbers get worse. And this is when you stop and think about it, and it's not entirely surprising because the rock or the aggregate in the system does not pass electrical charge, while the paste does. And so the more paste we have in the system, 
the higher the rapid chloride number is going to be. And the same data, you know, if, you, if we run the, the newer resistivity test, we see exactly the same trends. So it's not surprising. And I, and I go back to you know, the heresy a little bit earlier, adding cement is not the answer in many cases. I've already said, potential durability is the ability of the concrete to survive the environment. And that's valid for you know, fluids getting transported into our concrete, carrying nasty things with them, cold weather, ASR, all of these failure mechanisms uh, involve water getting through the system somewhere along the line. So let's keep it out. How do we control that fundamentally? Two ways. One, again, the water cement ratio. This is a very old PCA document <coughs> where lots of cement, not so much water. You can see that it doesn't take a lot of hydration product for us to fill that whole system with solids as opposed to voids. While if we have a high water cement ratio, we are, we're probably not going to fill the whole system up with solids. There are going to be voids, and those voids are likely to be connected or percolated. And so it's going to be easy for those nasty solutions to get in and through the concrete and do their nasty work. The other one is the cement chemistry. Modern cements create a whole lot more of this calcium hydroxide, these hexagonal shaped crystalline plates. Now, these are not necessarily deleterious, but and in, in one way, they're beneficial. They, they keep the pH of the system high, which protects the reinforcing steel. But in other ways, they are negative in that they are the first in the paste system that will dissolve in acids or in soft water. And uh, they also provide a planar weakness. So crack growth, uh, uh, cracks are more easily propagated through these crystals, flat, smooth shear planes, rather than cracks going through this complex system of calcium silicate hydrate fingers. So again, controlling both the chemistry so that we're limiting the amount of calcium hydroxide and reducing the water cement ratio are the, the two fundamental levers behind how we can make sure that we're getting durability. And I'll, I'll hark back to some of the points that Charlie was making in the last session this morning on how we balance out that strength and durability issues in our thought process. So several years ago, when we started to think about how do we write a better specification, we gathered together a whole bunch of experts, until, including several of the people in the session today and probably a number of you that were in the audience. And we bickered for two days and we went away and we thought about it for a year and then we came back and we bickered for another two, two days. And finally, we did come up with a consensus, is that for pavement concrete, there were six properties that were critical to ensure its performance. One, this idea of transport, keeping the water out. I've already beaten this theme to death several times in the last few minutes. The photograph is from Bourbon Street, New Orleans. And you can see there that that uh, photo, I think I took about a year ago, one of the last times I was on an airplane. And uh, that concrete is relatively new. The reason they had to replace it is that concrete can be attacked by uh, organic-based liquids, including alcohol and bodily fluids. And the nature of Bourbon Street is that there is an abundance of bodily fluids and alcohol spilled on the surface of the concrete. And the previous surface on there had been fairly badly deteriorated as a consequence of its exposure. So no free soil there, but other things attacking that concrete. Aggregate stability, decracking, alkali silica reaction, alkali carbonate reaction. We have to worry about those. Cold weather resistance for those of us that live in the, are foolish enough to live in the frozen north. And then the other parameters are not durability related, but do in impact performance, strength, shrinkage, and workability. And again, what Charlie was alluding to this morning is trying to balance the workability with the transport properties is a delicate art. The other thing that we decided when we started down the, the performance engineered mixtures pathway was to revisit when we do the testing. And the thought process is that there's a lot of tests that take time, are fairly complex and expensive. <coughs> we need to do a lot of that testing way up front when we're first designing or figuring out the proportions of our mixtures including calibration curves, so that 
we can measure for a given mixture the resistivity at 3, 7, 28, 56 days. The specification may call for a given number of 28 days, and yet the contractor, knowing that calibration curve, when he hits three days, gets the number that is right, can sleep, can be reassured that he's not going to be ripping out any slabs, and keep going with the process or with the mixture that is currently in place. So again, they start to play towards quality control and a better system at the end of the day. Uh, we also want to measure it during construction, monitoring the things that can aff affect the performance of the mixture after it's been delivered. You know, we can, we can measure the life out of the concrete as it comes out of the truck, but there's still a lot of activities like adding water that will badly affect the performance of that concrete, uh, even though it's uh, got a certificate at the point of delivery. And then there's the testing we need to do at the acceptance period. The contract states thou shalt get a given number at a given time. We do that testing at that time and the concrete gets paid for, it gets removed, or there's some sort of uh, financial uh, rebalancing. So, you know, again, there's these three different stages of when we're measuring. And basically the, the testing load in my mind is very significant early on. You're only doing it a couple of times until you get the mixture that you like. Process control is what the contractor needs to be doing to reassure themselves that what they're doing is right. And the, what the agency needs to measure is, is the concrete that's in place similar to all the results that we got at the pre-qualification, we're in good shape, we'll pay for it, and we know that it's gonna last for the design life. So those six critical properties, I'm gonna focus on the three that are relevant to durability. Keeping water out of the concrete, again, We've said it several times, durability is governed by permeability. The factors that are affected, water cement ratio, SCM type and dose, the degree of hydration, and of course, whether or not the concrete is cracked or not. And the illustration, you know, the, the point I often make with this little image is both of these systems, the light blue is a void and the gray is the paste. They both have the same porosity, but they don't have the same permeability and it is the permeability. This is the system that we want where the, where the pores are disconnected. How do we test for this property? Rapid chloride was the test de jour when I first arrived in the USA and uh, it served us well. It taught us how to think about durability as an ongoing process with our mixtures. The challenges with it is the, the equipment is relatively expensive the repeatability is horrible, and yet we still specify on it, um, but it, it, it had a, a great place. It has in many ways been superseded by the idea of resistivity. The theory being is that solids do not conduct electricity as well as liquids. So if we have a saturated sample, particularly if it's saturated with a known pore solution, uh, the, the less porosity there is, and the less continuity between those pores, the harder it will be to conduct electricity through it. And that's why the resistivity is a very good analog of permeability. Curing we're recommending is uh, store your cylinders. You can strip them and take them straight out of the molds at 24 hours, put them into a fixed salt solution, pull them out, put them under test, either using uh, the, 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 the four pin approach or this through, some, through the sample approach. Um, and then put it back in the bucket, pull it out again at seven days, 28 days, whatever your acceptance testing is. And uh, then even at 28 days, you can run a compression test on that same cylinder. Um, and this is proving to be a, a far more efficient way of understanding uh, the potential life of our mixtures. You can also calculate the formation factor which is the, the, the ratio of the resistivity of the bulk system divided by the resistivity of the solution. The bigger the number, the better. So again, a fairly quick, easy, cost-effective test that we can run for acceptance. Anything that's run for acceptance, we should have done the pre-qualification tests well before to understand where our mixture is going. From the point of view of cold weather, we worry about two factors. One is saturated freeze thaw. Water gets into all of the pores, including the air bubbles. Then um, it freezes. The water's got nowhere to go, and we get damage. And we've known this forever. 
Uh, and the reason we put air bubbles into the concrete is because they significantly slow the rate at which that saturation occurs. Um, and that's, yeah, that's why we put air into our systems. The other mechanism that has been troubling the Midwest, and we finally got a handle of it a few years ago, is this, this problem of oxychloride formation, a chemical reaction between um, the de-icing salts, particularly so, uh, potassium, uh, calcium chloride and uh, potassium chloride, and uh, the hydroxides, those crystal, uh, hexagonal crystals, causing a very rapid and very large expansion and leading to this sort of damage inside the kerf underneath the, the saw cut and leading to uh, the joints reaming out, both longitudinally and transversely. So again, we put bubbles in to slow the rate of saturation. The numbers we look for, 0 0.008 inch as the spacing factor has been around forever. I think it was 1952 that Klieger first talked about it. And then more recently, the super rare meter test where we're recommending a number, a pass fail number of the SAM number of 0.2. Um, where do we test the air void system? And that again is a point of debate. If we me measure it at the batch plant, it may change in transit. We can deliver it as it comes out the back of the truck and it can still change as it goes through the paving machine. Things that we have to be aware of and at least understand how much change is happening, how much air loss or agglomeration are we getting through the construction process. And again, it should be measured pre-qualification in the field and uh, for acceptance. How do we measure it? As I said, the old uh, pressure test is the, the regular way that we're all very familiar with. Um, we can run the volumetric test if we have lightweight aggregates in our system, not good for your back. We can run gravimetric, quick, easy, dirty. The, the, the reliability or the repeatability of that test is not the best. And the super air meter, uh, which seems to be providing a pretty good correlation between freeze-thaw resistance and the SAM number. But, and this is both field and lab data that's tending to support this. We can run microscopy, but that takes quite a lot of time. It's fairly expensive and should only be uh, if there's a, a fairly rigorous dispute. Noting also that 457 is not the gold standard in many ways because it is still a statistical model. So um, just be aware of that if, we're, if we are depending on it. For the de-icing salts, again, a reaction between calcium and mag chloride expands. The key part of this, it happens above 40 degrees. Larry Sutter was the first smart guy to keep samples in mag chloride at 40 degrees and got a whole bunch of reaction when the rest of us that were trying to freeze the stuff were not seeing anything. Um, but it leads to this sort of distress and uh, local owners are pretty unhappy about it. Prevention, put in enough supplementary cementing material into your mixtures. They eat up that calcium hydroxide. It's not available to go through this reaction. There are tests out there. The, the fancy one is the low temperature differential scanning calorimeter. Um, there are a couple of labs around that can run it for you, including us. If you need to understand how much SCM to put into your mixture, give me a shot. Otherwise, there is a, a dirty a much cheaper test that is based on expansion, the catch being that it takes about two months to run. So you can do the quick one and, and it's expensive, or you can do the slow one and it's cheap. And that's again, this is a pre-qualification test. We don't need to run it over and over again on concrete as delivered because presumably your cement chemistry, your fly ash chemistry, the fly ash dosage has not changed a whole hell of a lot batch to batch. And so whatever you settle on should be good enough for the life of the contract. ASR, I'm not gonna go into any detail, um, but it is a matter of concern that the aggregates may react, the wrong, the rights or the wrong sort of aggregates may react with the alkali hydroxyls in the cementitious system, causing this sort of distress. Topic of a lot of research, and in fact, FAA are about to put out an RFP with a whole bunch more money to be uh, thrown at this topic to get a, a better handle of how do we test it and understand it. There are protocols published by AASHTO and ASTM and recommend that you follow those in a, again in the, in the pre-qualification.
action stage, not for acceptance. Decracking, again, a localized issue in some states, aggregates absorb water, have a porosity or a pore size that the water is not released again, that water may freeze. And so, again, you can get this very characteristic cracking around uh, the soil uh, due to aggregate expansion because it's, expand it's freezing. <clears throat> Testing, there's no standardized uh, nationwide approach. There's the Iowa Pore Index test. Um, I know Mark, one of the following speakers, was uh, involved with the hydraulic fracture test. Many of the states that have this project uh, have this problem have their protocols in place. So go to your state DOT if you're at all worried about whether or not this is an issue. The other part of, of you know, ensuring that our mixtures are doing what they should be is this whole concept of quality control. The things that the contractor needs to be measuring and sh probably should not be reporting to the agency. Things like unit weight, calorimetry, maturity, all of these provide quick and dirty tools to tell us this truckload of concrete is the same as the stuff that we delivered yesterday, and that was good. And so we can keep an eye on the process on the, and we can keep a grip on the variability of the whole construction system, the materials coming in, the batching system, the transport, the placement. Uh, the one thing I would beg for is when you see something flag in your quality control system, do something about it. Uh, and, and that was this photograph. I watched this guy measuring the thickness of the slab for quite a while, uh, and it was always too thin but he didn't tell anyone. Um, so you know, what good is that? <clears throat> Some of the feedback we get is, wait, there's too many tests. You're asking us to do a whole bunch more. Well, we're asking you to uh, do a whole bunch more upfront to prove that the mixture design that you have is good. What about the variability? The super air meter does have a certain amount of variability, but that variability is way less than the rapid chloride test. And we've got used to accepting and rejecting concrete based on the rapid chloride test. The statistical tools should be able to allow us to, to deal with that. And as engineers, we hate change. Well, if you're really scared of change, uh, you shouldn't be listening to me over a computer because uh, we didn't have this technology as readily available two, three years ago. So, yeah. Change is good. It means we're making the best advantage of the materials that we have. And you know, again, any single slab taken out of the ground is far more expensive than all of the tests that you may need to cover on a single contract. So then it becomes a risk management decision. So I've talked about the critical properties along the, the horizontal axis here. I've talked about the levers that we can do, the, the things that in, a, in the mixed proportioning approach that we're recommending is that you can control your aggregate system, both in terms of the quality, the geology um, of the system and the gradation using, you know, for, for, air, for highway pavements, the tarantula curve seems to be the best way to go. So we control the aggregate system. We control the quality of the glue that is tying all of these materials together. And to do that, we fiddle with the air, the water cement ratio, the SEM type and dose. And man, in many ways, these are the things that that horizontal yellow line are the things that should be controlled by the specification. Those are the things the engineer should be asking for. The two white stripes are the things that the contractor should be given control over because they know their materials, their construction processes, their equipment the best. Then once we've got the, the aggregate system and the quality of the glue, we fool around with how much glue do we put into it? We need enough to fill all of the spaces between the aggregate and a little bit more to get the workability, which is what Charlie's concern was this morning. <clears throat> the point I would note is that the amount of paste that you need is not a fixed number. It is entirely dependent on the gradation of the aggregate system that you have in place. So if you change the gradation, the amount of paste that you need will also change. I also have a student working right now getting a better understanding if you change your aggregate type, whether it goes from being silicious to calcareous, if it goes from being gravel to crushed, getting, some, getting a handle of how much of the how much paste we need for those different classes of aggregates. But no one's done that work yet, and we're right in the thick of the lab testing right at the moment. This approach seems to be working. 
Um, <clears throat> you know, again, not knocking what we've done in the past. Much of our concrete has been great. A large part of our intent is to be to catch those few that get through the system and so shorten our life. Um, but by paying more attention, we guarantee that all of the concrete we deliver is going to be good. The mixed proportioning tool has been used in Iowa, Pennsylvania. It's actually uh, mandated in Wisconsin. And in all of those places, the feedback has been pretty positive. Many of the contractors know where I live and no one has pitched up here with a, with a rifle yet. So I'm pretty sure that we're saving the industry money. And that's what keeps us all employed. My final slide, a big fat thank you to Shiraz. I first met him when I joined CTL uh, back in 1997. And, uh, you know, they say that the way, to, the way to come across smart is to hang out with smart people. And Shiraz was one of the people that helped me to, to look smart. You know, he was always very available to challenge some of the things that we were doing and saying some of the re research we were doing. He really helped me and supported me in finding my way into the US industry and uh, providing me with opportunities to get into research projects and uh, activities that has been hugely beneficial. So for your encouragement and support, Shiraz, thank you. And just to note, he's not going away. He is actually under contract for us for the next couple of years to be playing with, continuing to play with precast concrete. So we're gonna be keeping him busy. And with that, Kurt, I'll hand it back over to you. I think I've got a minute for questions. Excellent. Yes, Peter, thank you very much. Appreciate that. And there is one question, Peter, in the, in the box and I'll just give it to you verbally and maybe you can give a quick response. Um, the uh, questioner asks that, or indicates that he agrees with the uh, importance of the water cement ratio, but uh, um, also points out that some design standards require a minimum cement content. And so is just wondering if a certain amount, if a minimum cement content is required for durability. I'm okay with a minimum cement content requirements just to keep the stupid ones off the table. What that number should be, I don't know. Wisconsin has adopted 520 pounds per cubic yard. I think that's too high. We just published a report from Minnesota where it was 470 was the lowest content we went to on one of the sections at the Moon Road test track. That was marginal. But again, that entirely depends on the aggregate system. But if you want to say a, a stupid fail safe, I'd probably go at 450. I know Jim Shilstone used to talk about being able to make great, great concrete at 420, but I think that it's going to take some effort. So, and for clarity, Peter, that's cement, or is that cementitious materials? Cementitious pounds per cubic yard. But you know, many states have a spec of 564, which was the old six sack mix. That's way too much. We don't need that. All right. Very good. Thank you, Peter. Appreciate it very much.